Uh, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much all for uh, joining us this morning. Um, this talk is going to be a little bit of biology from the perspective of sort of a computational physics who works with uh, very skilled uh, simulation people who collaborate with a large number of experimental groups, all coming together on some very important problems. Then we'll talk a little bit about supercomputing, uh, some recent work there, and uh, GPU development as well. So, uh, moving forward, uh, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. This is sort of the textbook illustration of how it works. On the left here, we have sort of the entire virus. On the outside, you have a a uh, lipid capsule that is populated with all sorts of proteins that allow it to basically sneak up to the cell membrane, get through the body without being you know, cleared by the immune system, and merge with the cell. Um, if it makes it through that, it sort of sheds its outer coat, and we have the capsid, which is this internal orange structure that contains the uh, DNA and the nuclear, nucleic materials of the virus. Once inside the cell, let's see, so we have to bind, fuse with the membrane, go inside, and bind. The capsid has to uh, uncoat, get the DNA material inside the nucleus of the cell, uh, where it actually then binds and integrates into the DNA of the cell, thus taking over the cell, causing it to create new viruses. So these encapsid and uh, nuclear import stages are important, because if we look at how we treat HIV today, we have you know, drugs that attack it, try to prevent it from fusing with the cell. We have ones that try to prevent reverse transcription. Uh, we have ones that try to prevent integration into the genome. And we have ones that try to prevent it from budding out. Uh, there are no drugs that attack either the uncoating of the capsid to release the DNA or the importing of the DNA into the nucleus of the cell. Um, we believe that one reason that uh, monkeys uh, can coexist with the simian AIDS virus without actually getting sick is because they have regulation and a way to control this process. So um, this is a large simulation by many scales. So I mean, if you looked, if you were here at 9 a.m. for Romy's talk, uh, she's sort of working on things at the scale of the left. You get up to sort of things like the ribosome, which creates uh, proteins in the cell. You're about three million atoms for a full si simulation. Uh, this thing's going to be, you know, on the order of 100 million atoms. Um, so we said, hey, we've got collaborators. We want to do this work. Um, it's going to be this big of a simulation. They said, no, 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 just coarse grain the thing. I mean, you can, you can just put this thing together. You can run that. That'll be fine. Um, so luckily, uh, this was about the same time we were a target application. There's a little bit of eye candy for you here. This is some cryo data showing the type of 3D structures of these viruses uh, that we have available. Luckily, when we started doing this, uh, we were also a target application for the Blue Water Supercomputer at NCSA, and we were able to get allocations on that, both as an early science project and for uh, later production to make these simulations a reality. Uh, this is sort of half art, half structure of the virus. This is the capsid. This is the part that we are simulating. If you look at the structure, um, it's made up of a single type of protein. It's called CA, the capsid protein. It assembles into 186 hexamers, 12 pentamers, if you know your math. Um, 12 hexamers, any number of hexamers plus 12 pentamers will give you a closed surface. So to close the surface, we have 12 pentamers. Um, want to start the simulation by, you know, we need to build this model. We can't crystallize this, get x-ray coordinates, know exactly where all the atoms are. Um, but we can crystallize individual proteins, and that's been done. We know the structure of the proteins. But we want to figure out what the whole thing looks like. Well, our experimental colleagues can make tubular versions of this capsid, and they get very good cryo-electron microscopy data. We merge this with an X-ray crystal structure that tells us where all the atoms are, just not in this conformation. And we use a method called molecular dynamics flexible fitting, where we take sort of the electron density that we get from the microscope and merge that, and basically we fit the X-ray crystallographic structure into that, and from that we get sort of a very, you know, a combination of the two techniques giving us atomic resolution plus, uh, you know, sort of organelle scale simulation. So that is the hexagons. We've got 
data for that. We need to fill in the pentagons as well. Um, so for this, we have to go purely uh, with simulations. So we piece together the way that we think that these things look and let it go. And lo and behold, this is without any steering from cryon electron microscopy. Uh, the things come together, binds very nicely, um, and forms a hexagon. So I'd like to point out that my boss, Professor Klaus Schulten, just gave a national lecture at the Biophysical Society meeting a couple weeks ago, um, for which a lot of work was done preparing very nice slides, and I even switched the keynote to use this material for you. So um, we take the pentamers, we take the hexamers, we put them all together, uh, we get this structure, uh, 4.2 million atoms. Of course, that's just protein. Um, then we want to solvate that. So we put it in a box of water, and we end up with 64 million atoms, which is much larger. Because remember, this thing is big, it's hollow on the inside, and you need to solvate the outside. And we let it run, and lo and behold, it's a stable structure. Now we believe we have the correct structure of the HIV virus caps, and we can do things with it. Okay, so that was a big deal, um, sort of in and of itself. We got on the cover of Nature, um, and you know, this was a nice little award from the media. But what do we actually learn from these simulations? Well, there are a couple interesting things. Um, one point I like to make about this capsid is it's not a sphere. It's not symmetric in any way. All of the little capsid proteins are in a completely different environment. There is not a good way to simplify this. Um, you know, you can try, you can make models of things that look like this, but it's not gonna tell you anything about how this actually works. We have different bite angles, we have different, you know, orientations. Um, what regulates the curvature? Well, we know that it's something with this trimer interface because we actually have experimental feedback. So they were able to grow in vivo these uh, tubular, all, all hexagonal um, versions of the virus capsid. We did simulations. We proposed mutating this uh, one amino acid from uh, alanine to cysteine that would strengthen this one interface at the trimer. And lo and behold, they do that mutant, and they get things that look like the in vivo virus, an actual closed capsid. So we understand this process. Uh, we also know that this capsid acts as an osmotic regulator. So ions permeate through the capsid to provide sort of balance through the system. So not only is the capsid protein forming this entire shell, it's also acting as a pore um, to regulate inside and outside. And this is after running for a microsecond simulation. So these are not large, short simulations. These are large, long simulations. Um, but what can we actually say about the infection process? So how does HIV infection work? So we have this encoding process. What we believe happens is that the HIV actually has to make it intact all the way to what's called the nuclear pore complex. Nuclear pore complex basically has a lot of wavy things sticking out that whatever wants to get in the pore, it sort of has to melt that to get through. And there are very specific interactions with this. And you know, sort of the nuclear pore context needs to interact with that capsid protein. So it's not just the structure, it's also the function for getting into the nuclear pore. Um, so it has to get there. And along this way, it sort of binds various things, including uh, cyclophilin. And if you've heard of cyclophilin, it's because that's what the drug interferon acts on. So it's related to your immune system, drug transplants. It's very, very relevant. HIV sort of attracts a coat of these things because what the host cell wants to do is uncoat it so that it can't bind to the nucleus, it can't get through. What's the role of this cyclophilin? Is this just the cell attacking it? Well, um, when we actually model this, we see that you know when you put the cyclophilin adjacent to the capsid, it sort of forms these little dimer things, and we have this additional links between pairs happening. And we were, you know, it's a very small change, but it's actually significant, um, and it gives us sort of a very specific binding pattern onto the capsid. And that binding pattern is enough cyclophilin that something called the trim lattice cannot bind. So the trim factors are really pretty cool. So if you notice, you know, you've, if you've seen sort of the way structures in the human body look, they don't look like this. Viruses build things that are assembled from basically the entire, the same protein in sort of this hexagonal lattice. So your body 
has this trim factor that sort of binds to things that might be a hexagonal lattice, and if it forms these sort of centers at the corners of the adjacent hexagons, this other factor called E2 binds, and when E2 binds, that's basically a big degrade me sign, which causes other proteins in the cell to come in and degrade it. So the cyclophilin prevents trim from binding, but not enough of the cyclophilin binds so that it can't get through the nuclear pore complex. So cyclophilin actually plays a very important role in getting through this. And one of the drugs, uh, PF74, that has been shown to, to sort of work on HIV, but unfortunately also kills the patient, um, we believe interacts with the cyclophilin. So we have some understanding, the paper is submitted, I don't have slides, of how that drug works through this whole process. So part of the takeaway is, so for these very large systems, life operates at the atomic scale. Every atom matters, you can't ignore things. So not only, you know, don't always listen to your referees, yes, it's nice to be able to go to a coarse gray model that you can run very long periods of time, but don't simplify things before you understand them, before you know what the important details are. Okay, so that's the HIV project. Lots of people worked on this. Um, Juan Priya did most of the simulations. Professor Schulten, uh, the leader of the lab, experimental collaborators, and Professor Kale is the uh, sort of computer science uh, PI for the NAMDI project. Okay, so beyond that group of people, even larger group of people uh, works at the Beckman Institute. We developed two main software codes, uh, NAMDI, which does molecular dynamics, and BMD, which does molecular visualization, analysis, all of the system set up tasks for uh, NAMDI, and it, you know, it's, it's just an awesome visualization code, and it's got lots of GPU acceleration. If you've seen, heard the name John Stone, he's a CUDA fellow. Um, he's giving, I think, at least two talks at this conference, so great stuff there. Um, as far as NAMDI goes, we're funded by the NIH. We make our tools available, including the tools for the HIV virus capsid, all the way down. Um, we try to make them very usable. You don't under have to understand what's going on inside. It helps if you understand the chemistry um, and a little bit of the physics. But we want to be able to have you start out, learn on a desktop or a laptop and scale all the way up to the largest supercomputers in the world um, using basically a consistent interface without having to switch things up. So usability is very important and available free of charge to everyone. So these 100 million atom simulations, they are not routine. Um, for one thing, setting them up is difficult, particularly when you have an inside of something to fill. You put too little water in, you get a bubble. You put too much water in, you get geysers coming out the side. Um, some things don't work as well at scale, um, simply because there's functionality versus scalability issues. Um, we have some issue partners. Um, the real challenges, of course, are that, you know, running these large simulations require leadership machines. Even with GPUs, these are still very challenging. Um, that's coming over time. You know, the value of these simulations expands. Um, computers get faster. Uh, the other problems, of course, we have, you know, you need to be able to manipulate things of this scale. So, you know, a single frame from one of these simulations is a gigabyte. That's like one snapshot in time. We want to analyze movies of these things. That's a lot of data. So. When we heard Blue Waters was coming, we actually got a special equipment grant from NIH, got 10 gigabit, gigabit networking, large performance workstations, and we've been improving this, and this is available to visiting researchers. So if you want to do one of these very large simulations, you are welcome to come and visit. Um, this is what our facilities are for. Uh, we have several projects going on in the group, people you can talk to if you're here at 9 a.m. Um, you know, Romy Amaro's group is working on similar types of things, and we're happy to work with her. Um, so, this is nice, you know, Illinois is lovely in the spring for a couple of weeks, in the fall for a couple of weeks. <laughs> we don't get as much snow as Chicago, um, and if you like flat, it's great. But this is not the ideal solution. First of all, I don't like downloading the data even, you know, half a mile from Blue Waters. What I want is I want all the storage, compute, and particularly visualization resources embedded in the same site as the supercomputer. So then, we're just sending compressed video. And I say a gigabit network, but you don't even need that. You can send this. We've had, you know, compressed video running over, you know, a cell phone, and it works just fine. This is what we need, 
And this was my goal last year to make this happen, and it didn't quite get there. Um, I wish I could have updated this slide more. So at Texas, uh, the Stampede system has very nice uh, remote visualization capabilities. It's a little old, it's not the latest technology. Um, Blue Waters has nothing. We're working with them to try and get remote viz working from the actual GPU enabled compute nodes on the machine. Uh, they only have 32 gigs of memory, so it's not great, but it's better than nothing. Uh, Titan last year added a new visualization cluster that was different from the old visualization cluster in that it did not have GPUs on the new one. So they're, they're working on that. Um, so locally, we've gotten some new workstations and we're using the nice DCV product, which you can see on the show floor for remote access. And we've been very happy with that product in the month or so that we've been testing it. So hopefully, this is something that next generation machines will simply have to provide because really, if we wanna do larger, longer simulations, moving the data is just silly, storing it twice is just silly. So please, 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 remote visualization, Important, yeah, not just silly, impossibly silly, and silly impossible. Okay, and this also affects me because I wanna do performance analysis. I don't wanna to have to copy 25 gigabytes of data to look at like, you know, a handful of processors and figure out what the trace is, so I would also benefit from this. So, uh, on the software side, we had a release in uh, December which basically wrapped up everything that we had done to date, everything that enabled the HIV simulations, and this was really, Blue Waters has been driving our development work for almost the past five years. So very large type of simulations. This is in production for multiple sites. As I said, Romeo Amaro's group is doing an influenza virus simulation. They have an allocation on Blue Waters now. Uh, but the other type of simulation we're trying to en enable is for smaller simulations, replica exchange. So being able to do smart sampling by coupling different simulations together. There's a variety of different methods. Um, and this got better even with GPUs and some other improvements. Uh, just to show you what the replica exchange simulations are capable of, this is a much smaller simulation. This is about 100,000 atoms versus 100 million. But you're looking at a process that takes milliseconds because this is not a pore that ions go through. This is a transporter which controls what goes through it. And it does that through what is commonly referred to as the inward facing, outward facing. So you have to open the inside door, close it, then open the outside door so you can control what goes through. And this transformation is actually relatively, you know, pretty significant for a protein to be doing this during its function. So to do this, um, this is uh, Mahmoud Muradi's work from the group of Mahan Tash Gurshid. Um, they use a lot of different replicas, different methods, um, strings, because first of all, you have to find the path. And once you find the path, then you have to very carefully measure what your free energy differences are through the path. And those are two very different stages because if you take the wrong path, you get completely the wrong answer. You want the lowest energy path because that's the one that actually happens. And this is the final result. So we're starting out open to the top and ion comes in and you can see the pore sizes changing. And as we're going through this transformation, what we're looking at here is that there is the top state is APO, which means that there is nothing bound inside the channel, and the bottom half is with the substrate bound. Since it's a transporter, it opens much more easily with the substrate bound. You only want it to open when you have something connected to it because the goal is one thing comes in, one thing leaves, and you can have an exchange, but you don't have things randomly flowing one direction or another. As I said, that's a port, and they get this very good agreement, they get agreement with experiment, wonderful work. So just to show you a variety of different things working, and this is uh, Professor Tash Krishid, closely related to our group, actually in the same space. Okay, on to NAMD. So the NAMD software is based on something called Charm++. We're gonna shift to more of a computer science mode at this place. Um, and so Klaus Schulten and Lox Picant Kalek shared uh, the Fernbach Award a couple years ago at supercomputing for the development of NAMD. There's a book about this. There's a website. Um, it's sort of a specialized system, basically trying to make difficult to parallelize programs easier to write. Um, as far as we use it in NAMD, you can think of it as parallel term plus plus with what we call data-driven objects. So you have um, asynchronous method invocation. So if you want to call something in another processor, you send a message there and continue on with your work. 
at some point later, that's received, it sends a message someplace else. Um, prioritizing the order in which these messages are executed is important uh, for performance, although not for correctness. Um, it employs measurement-based load balancing on uh, CPU runs, and finally, it provides a portable messaging layer. So similar to MPI, Charm++ is available on pretty much every platform. Uh, NAMD started out in the early 90s, and we have sort of this dual decomposition. So the blue squares are sort of spatial domains that contain the atoms, and then the pink diamonds are interactions between the atoms. So non-bonded calculus, so non-bonded electrostatics, Van der Waals type interactions, bonded terms, and so we've really decomposed separately the data from the work so that we can load balance the work, um, and everything happens sort of asynchronously uh, within a time step and is to whatever degree possible at cross time steps. So up at the top, you know, we have the spatial domains, they're doing integration, which is the easy part of F equals MA, that is mass time, is you get your forces, divide by the mass, that's your acceleration, update velocities, update positions. In the middle is the force part of F equals MA, calculating the different bonded, non-bonded, and long-range electrostatics parts. Uh, PME is a very popular uh, method of calculating non-cutoff electrostatics for periodic systems. It's based on Fourier transforms. Fourier transforms require a transpose to do in parallel. Um, and then this whole process loops. Uh, the most expensive part of this, of course, is the non-bonded calculation, so that's the part that we offloaded to GPUs. Uh, we did this work uh, back in 2007, published at SC2008. Um, overlapping sort of work between the CP and the GPU, so we have remote forces and local forces being calculated on the CPU, um, transfer positions to the GPU, calculate the remote force on the GPU, overlapping, transfer that back, when we get the remote force passes back, we can start communication with other nodes because we expect that to be the expensive part, and then we do the local forces last, lower priority on both the GPU and the CPU, uh, update positions, and repeat the process. This is what it actually looked like using the Charm++ tracing tool projections back in 2008. So you can see in red we have integration, uh, data transfer, different force calculations, and pink is sort of the interactions with the GPU. Uh, this is what it looks like now. This is one node of Blue Waters running a 20 million atom simulation on 1,024 nodes. Um, so, uh, starting from the top, uh, the pink line at the very top shows the time during which the GPU is active, actually running the non-bonded force kernels. Uh, the bright yellow is interaction uh, between the CPU and the GPU. So up at the top, we have submission in bright yellow, starting it off, and then we have the results flowing back in yellow from the GPU. Uh, first, we have the first band is the uh, higher priority remote forces that need to be communicated off node, and we see inter node communication happening below. And then finally, we have the local forces coming back, which allows uh, integration in red to proceed forward to the next time step because the results have already come in from other nodes, and we see this overlapping across all of the cores with incoming position communication and the bonded force calculation on the CPUs. Uh, the very bottom line on the graph is actually the communication thread, so it is not doing calculation. It is entirely dedicated to driving the network, uh, sending and receiving messages from the node. Okay. so. Uh, one of the little things in CUDA that was interesting is so we want to overlap. We have the remote kernel, force kernel, and the local force kernel. GPUs, modern GPUs, can overlap those. We want to do that. When uh, Kepler came out and they put a priority queue, one bit of priority, we'd been saying, you know, we'd really like priorities on these GPUs. They gave us one bit of priority. Um, unfortunately, they also took changed, I shouldn't say unfortunately, they also increased the flexibility with which the GPU can push work onto itself. In Fermi, the order you submit work is the order that that work will launch on the GPU, and there are all sorts of instructions on Fermi for, okay, you know, this is how you interleave your different work so it will actually overlap. Kernel gets rid of that, Kepler gets rid of that, 
And the problem is that if you submit work to a high priority queue, a high priority stream, followed by a low pro work to a low priority stream, there's no guarantee that the high priority stream is gonna start first. There's a race condition, perfectly legal in CUDA, whereby the, high, the low priority stream may start second. Do I have those labels wrong? No, I don't. So yes, so the, the orange here is actually the low priority, and we have the low priority queue starting first, being preempted by the high priority queue, and then continuing after the high priority. So we have an additional lag set in right about here um, where we do that. Now there's a workaround for this. It's very simple, and all we do is we give the low priority stream something extra to do, a very small mem set of you know, a few thousand bytes, um, and that fixes this problem. And also we don't need the priority feature, so we can do this on GeForce cards. Um, we don't actually need the expensive Tesla version, so that's nice. Um, Kepler shuffle instructions came in very handy for implementing uh, reductions within the kernel, um, doing that port. We also like to support uh, Fermi GPUs for probably another, at least for 2.10, probably not, possibly not for 2.11. Um, merging different types, you can actually introduce uh, macros. So basically we have a macro that turns on the different types of reductions. Okay, uh, new Maxwell cards are out, just for some comparisons. Um, so uh, the K80, one processor or two processors, uh, Titan Black is sort of what uh, we've been, had been using on our local desktops and workstations. Um, GTX 980, the first of the Maxwell cards came out. Um, nice improvement over uh, the old Titan Black and just recently we've had access to both the Titan X and its uh, sister card, the M6000, which will be formally announced in the next couple of days. Uh, the new Titan X is 60% uh, faster than Titan Black, so uh, if you're choosing between Titan Black and Titan X and you wanna run Nambi and you don't need double precision for something else, go for the Titan X. Uh, it is also 30% faster than the GTX 980, um, but it's also two, two and a half times more expensive than the GTX 980, so. Uh, that decision you have to decide. NAMD doesn't really need 12 gigs of memory. Uh, for VMD, however, for actual visualization work, John is very excited about the Titan X. So he's, he's looking forward to doing some great things with optics. Um, okay, so as far as 2-7 goes, sounds great. Uh, we've heard of it. C++11 features sound awesome. Uh, runtime compilation, I can see a lot of potential applications uh, for that. Basically, rather than having branch statements in our kernels, we can compile in sort of runtime settings for the users, eliminate some of that. Um, unfortunately, Cray is sort of stuck at 2.5.5 um, because they have to specialize the drivers for some way, and they've been working on 2.6.5 for, I don't know, quite a while. We not, they actually skipped 2.6 because they were gonna go directly to 2.6.5. Um, apparently, it's coming soon, so. We will have that, we will still not have Q to seven features probably for quite a while and um, until it's sort of supported on Blue Waters, which is honestly where we get most of our cycles right now, it's not something we're gonna be looking at uh, too closely, but looks very excited and I look forward to using it in the future. Okay, so looking at uh, the way performance goes here, so we have, what slide am I on? Oh, right on time, ish. Okay, GPUs are getting faster. The most, you know, floating floating point intensive code gets moved to the GPU. What's left on the CPU um, tends to be the stuff that was not as highly tuned before. It's the stuff that is not as vectorizable, doesn't port well to the GPU. So you need a CPU that runs serial code particularly well uh, for these large flexible codes. And also, you know, you've got CPU sort of single thread performance is staying about the same. So the strategy that we're taking is we're sort of focusing on the CPU side of the code, and the things that are the bottlenecks there, we wanna move those to the GPU. Uh, we also wanna focus on communication. So there is, you know, whatever overhead there is on the, on the CPU, if we're not using the network well, um, and, you know, are we using the network topology, the machine is a torus, what can we do to improve that? That's what's gonna get us a performance increase. Um, so we had a paper at Supercomputing where we talked about both adapting to the torus of Cray machines, um, 
have a variety of different methods there, and then some additional techniques on uh, dealing with PME, other sort of bottlenecks for performance. Um, so a couple highlights from this. Um, when I say things like irregular torus topologies, the good old IBM Blue Jeans machines, perfect power of two, isolated network, um, complete performance reproducibility. On the Cray machines, uh, the older XEXK series like Blue Water and Titan, um, you've got stuff running, the scheduler adds your job to whatever processes are free, you may get not get a completely compact, contiguous, nice uh, allocation. Blue Waters has done some great work on that, I'll describe later. Um, and even if you're running on the entire machine, there are I.O. nodes scattered throughout the machine, so you don't get a perfect power of two things. So we have to actually take, you know, a, a different approach to actually get a good mapping on this. So um, basically we take what we get from Charm++ about the topology of the machine, we do some modifications to that so that we get a nice clean representation of the torus, whatever section of it we've actually been allocated. Um, and then we use sort of a recursive bisection method. So if we've got the machine we're running on and say we wanna split this into four different replicas, um, we sort of scan along until we get halfway through and then we take each of those subsections and we scan in what's called the snake scanning curve through the second half and you see we get pretty compact uh, representations. This is you know, similar, the native node ordering, you get something that's more of a space filling curve, but it's not really adapted to the structure that you have. So uh, for the patches within NAMD, we also wanna map those onto the torus. So the priorities here are, so for starters, the first thing is ignore the torus, get the right structure within the nodes. We want a compact sat patch set within you know, each physical node that's available. And then we do that, and we sort of do the same method of uh, recursive bisection, both on the processors, which have gaps in them, and the patches, which are consistent, but maybe a completely different number. So you can run any job, any number of processors. Um, when I say processors, think of those as nodes. So you do these two scans, and you sort of match first half, first half, second half, second half. You do bisections, and as I said, when you're deciding how to bisect the patches, you ignore how you're bisecting the processors. But you try to bisect the processors the same way that you're bisecting the patches. But you do this and you iterate this all the way down until you have a single node's worth of patches. And then within that node, you can do whatever you want and it doesn't really matter for performance as far as the network is concerned because you're all in the same node. Uh, for the particle mesh Ewald things, we have uh, different stages of communication. We're going from the spatial domains to the decomposition of the FFT, which is a pencil decomposition. So we try to align the first set. We go from the spatial cubes to Z pencils. Z pencils talk to Y pencils. Y pencils talk to X pencils. Back again to do the transpose to get uh, the forces out. So we optimize communication to the Z pencils. And then we sort of op have to pick either ZY or YX transposes. So we sort of optimize the YX transposes by placing them within contiguous ranks as much as possible. Um, the CUDA kernel, so when you get to very large simulations, um, the work that's happening, the first thing that we have to do is drop the resolution of the PME grid from one angstrom to two angstrom, but use eighth order rather than fourth order interpolation. That gives us much more work to do on the CPU. Fortunately, we have a GPU, so we can migrate that work to the GPU. And this was basically done in the simplest design that sort of works. Um, we have one atom per warp, which is pretty good because we're going eight by eight by eight, so that's a lot of work to do per atom, iterate through all the atoms, and then we use atomic operations to accumulate onto a charge grid in global memory. Um, one problem with uh, driving the GPU is you can't throw too many small kernels at it from all of the different processors, so we have to aggregate this. Um, initially, it was slower. Eventually, we got it down to one launch per patch, and finally, we said, okay, this is using atomic operations. We're gonna have one big charge grid for the entire node and that gave us a big speed up because suddenly we're sending fewer messages per node in addition uh, to getting the work onto the GPU. So uh, this is a review. This is what the non-PME steps look like, the different tags, integration, communication, bonded work, GPU, the pink stripe up at the top, results coming back. And this is what PME looks like, so we have PME sort of tagged in green here, the kernel submission goes on, and we submit that kernel, 
then we can submit the non-bonded journal because PME involves more communication, it's higher priority. Uh, we go to polling on one process for the return of the PME kernel. Uh, when that happens, we have the transposes happening, so the arrows sort of indicate the different objects that are doing sending, messages come in, the FFT is parallelized, the message sends are parallelized across the threads within a node, which are these black gaps. Uh, white means idle, black means doing something for somebody else. Arrow, so we go, teal is the Z pencil, green is the Y pencil, orange is the X pencil, um, which is the longest in this case, so it takes longer. Green is back to the Y pencil, teal is back to the Z pencil, and then back to the patches where we have to undo the force calculation. So green is submitting a whole bunch of different grids, one for each PE, and then the PEs in orange are individually polling for those results to come back. When they do, they immediately proceed uh, with integration and the whole cycle repeats, okay? As you'll notice, this time step is shorter than the PME time step. So we have all this idle time at the end because of the time that communication takes. Okay, when we run uh, perilous calculations on the GPU, it takes longer, so we can observe that we're using a priority kernel for the PME calculation, so that even while the non-bonded kernel is running, the PME results come back earlier, and then we proceed. Okay, so performance results, we're using synthetic benchmarks because again, building these big systems is expensive. So, uh, we have this, and when we're doing these runs, we wanna disable individual optimizations, and one other thing, as I said, you get different allocations on these machines. You get a lot of performance variance, even within the same run, but definitely between runs. So, you wanna measure if you're having an performance impact, you gotta run different versions of the code, different options back to back in the exact same job. So, uh, topology adaptation, uh, when you're running on the entire machine, it can be worth like a 50% uh, performance increase. So that's, that's pretty good for you know, running the exact same machine. Um, as you go for a smaller number of nodes, less impact because you're not pushing the edge of the scaling curve, the performance of the network isn't as important. We also found several ways to make the performance worse by messing with uh, how we lay things out. So as it turns out, uh, the native machine node ordering is pretty good. Um, one of our earlier ideas for you know, how to get things out of the partitioner made it worse, and randomizing it makes it even worse, um, even as small as like 2,000. So topology does matter, um, but Cray isn't, you know, once you start with is horrible. Um, other optimizations, uh, we got 10% from reducing some synchronizations, offloading to the GPU about 20%. Uh, the big jump though was switching to from a one angstrom grid to a two angstrom PME grid and doing a third interpolation. Okay, uh, comparing to other machines, so we have some Xeon Phi numbers, Stampede CPU only, and Blue Waters XE6, which is two Opteron processors versus XK7, which is one Opteron processor and one Kepler GPU. Um, Blue Waters scales very nicely. The faster you run, the harder it is to scale. That's not surprising. And the new Cray Edison XC30 scales great. Uh, the issues with the Taurus topology, they have fixed. Uh, they may have been replaced with other issues. We don't know because they have not built a machine much larger than 4,000 nodes yet. But uh, for this, you know, we're getting actually better performance running to scale on the XC30 than we could uh, on Titan up to 4,000 nodes. We'll get back to that later. Uh, the other thing we wanna do, so you saw before we were sort of getting the remote answer results and the local results back. What we really wanna do is stream those results out to the CPU um, progressively over time. And so um, to do that, we can merge different things. So we've been sort of kicking this code around for a while, um, and we have you know, sort of basic operations. So on the GPU side, we use thread fence system, sync threads, use an atomic increment to um, host mapped memory, and then you know, basically thread, you know, thread fence system again, right to the force ready queue. On the host, um, we're simply pulling this piece of data. Um, when it's not negative one, we know, hey, we've got data, so we can process that data as it comes through. Um, 
but so it's important we want these numbers to come out in output order and particularly we want to get n data as soon as possible. So if you have different sizes, so more distant patches take less time to run than ones that have a lot of work in them, the order that you put things into a GPU, and this is a very simple, basically a two core GPU here, um, we launch things, you know, one, two, three, four, and things come out in a different order because one takes longer, so you get two, three, four, five first, and we get this different order. Now, for a non-streaming kernel, you sort stuff longest to shortest, and you get, you know, a very compact arrangement, and you get all your results at the end, so it doesn't really matter. Um, can we do better? Well, the strategy is, let's say, okay, we run it backwards. So we reverse the order of the priorities when we want to get things out, and what we end up with is sort of this output order, 87654. Um, we reverse that and use that as the order that we feed it in, so one, four, two, three, nine, and we get things out close to the order, as close to the order, more or less, that you can get, plus it's much more compact. You could do slightly better, you could swap nine to launch right after one, but then you would delay two slightly. So it's a pretty good trade-off, and for a method that requires zero knowledge or analysis of the workload or the calculation, this works really well. It's like four extra lines of code, we don't have to measure anything, and it's way better than what we were, and it allows streaming to win even on a single node. Uh, the next question is, what order do we actually want stuff out in? Well, we want, as I said, remote results before local. Um, we want to distribute the local work across threads so that when we get the local work out, we can process it and it's evenly distributed where that work goes. Slight preference for the GPU. And the final thing that we realized is if you don't even have to send new positions off nodes, you're even lower priority, but that's not been implemented yet. So again, this is what the non-streaming kernel looks like, where we have these bright blue bursts of first remote and then local coming from the GPU, first for a non-PME time step, and on the right, a PME time step. So look at the size of those pink bars and look at how much work is being done when the GPU is perfectly idle. We switch to the streaming kernel, there's a lot less space between the pink bars at the top when the CPU is running, and we have basically the red integration work firing off progressively during the time step, and a lot more communication, so that by the time you get to the PME time step, you know, you're really doing pretty well. So breaking this down, again, this is the non-streaming kernel, different labels, and compare that to the streaming kernel, much closer together on the pink, and we can see these bursts of yellow coming out, and even as the red starts, it's evenly distributed across the PME. And then for the PME term, again, we're doing the same thing, polling, have the communication. This takes roughly the same sort of amount of time. This is, this is the non-streaming non kernel, PME kernel. You compare that, the actual PME start part takes roughly the same amount of time, but non-streaming pink is way over here, now there's much less time between the other time steps. And that's because we're basically limited by the network. We can't do much better. But it pushes things out of the way. Okay, so for a perilous step, again, we mentioned on the right that we get this overlap between PME, and this is what it looks like for the streaming kernel. Again, you start getting results out, basically rather than waiting until the very end of the kernel after PME, you don't have enough work to continue integration for all of the patches, but as soon as you get those PME back results, results coming back in orange, then some patches can start integrating and the rest of them coming along the way. So again, pink, very close together. Okay, um, as far as the performance of this goes, um, so for Blue Waters, adding this new streaming kernel, um, it actually makes scalability worse because when you've got more work to stream, you do better. So we're getting like 30% performance boost on 256 nodes. You go up to the entire XK partition, about 4,000 nodes, only a 10% boost. But still, pretty good. Um, after I did this, I did some extra tuning on the PME to better distribute that, and we got another 5% out of that sort of across the board. Um, then we want to compare that to Titan. So we went and ran uh, stuff on Titan, and Titan does significantly worse. And we also have some older results from Titan, um, and we see, you know, even without these improvements, 
you know, we do well up to about 1,024 nodes, not as well as Blue Waters, and then scaling sort of keels over, and eventually we end up that, you know, Titan for this simulation is five to 25% slower than Blue Waters, which is basically an identical machine. Why? Well, so Blue Waters has recently turned on topology aware scheduling to give us much better, you know, compactness of the partitions that we're running on. So this is what we're running on now. As you can see, you get nice convex holes and you can tell the scheduler, hey, my code is sensitive, my code is insensitive. Um, lots of debugging work went into this because, you know, making codes run faster is great until the scheduler crashes and the machine is idle for a day. Um, but yeah, that's the most like the explanation. So if you see anyone from NCSA, give them a high five. Uh, if you see anyone from Oak Ridge, tell them, hey, we heard some great stuff about this Blue Water scheduler. Um, and they gave this uh, full paper on this at the Cray Users Group meeting last week. Um, so, okay. So final comparisons. So we've got, you know, these different numbers. Um, so slightly better comparing to our SC14 numbers, going all the way out for a much larger system. So this is 224 atoms. Uh, modeled on uh, Romeo Morrow's or influenza virus. Um, we get a little bit better, but again, scaling to the entire machine, when you hit half the machine, that's when you're most topology sensitive because half of the machine is interfering with your job. Um, so at that worst case, we are about, you know, the same place we were back at SC, but when you go to the whole machine, then we're doing slightly better. And we're getting up to about seven milliseconds per step. Okay, if we compare this with some CPU-only machines, we'll put Edison back on here. Um, and these are, you know, SC14 numbers, so they haven't really been any tuning for the Jeep CPU version that should affect performance. Uh, but as you can see, we are now on Blue Waters beating XC30 on 4,000 nodes. So we're very happy with that. Uh, Titan isn't quite there, but it's, it's pretty close. And the overall speed up from the GPU accelerated version, the XK7 versus the equivalent XC6 um, on Blue Waters, two to three times as fast. Uh, Titan, um, three times as fast down to maybe, you know, only 50% faster, but for the largest system full scale, still worth 70%. So GPUs, still a good idea. Um, in conclusion, so brief recap, in biology, chemical detail matters. Don't throw them away unless you know that you don't care about them, not just that you don't think. Um, remote visualization will be necessary for larger versions of machines if we want to continue this work. Uh, with replica exchange strategies, you can need really large time scales um, using existing technology across parallel platforms. Um, network topology matters, you need to map to that. Streaming results from the GPU in priority order gave us a significant performance boost. And finally, if your scheduler is doing a bad job on the torus of your machine, that will definitely harm performance. And with that, a uh, variety of acknowledgments, and thank you very much.